Hey everyone, welcome to the June uh, CIC webinar. Um, thank you, Aurora WDC, for sponsoring our webinar this month. Um, this webinar is just part of the content that the SLA CI community produces. In addition to our webinar programs, the CIC is planning a fantastic lineup of presentations at the virtual SLA conference. So hopefully you all be able to take part this August. Uh, next slide, please. We want to get to know our members and to help make connections within the CI community. Um, we do plan to feature member perspectives, um, for example, like how being a member helps you in your professional life, what your favorite webinar topics and takeaways are, and any advice you'd like to share in the CIC community. So look for a link in the chat pane, um, and you can use this brief form to share your story and perspective with us, perspectives with us. Uh, we'd really like to hear from you. Uh, next slide. Um, we are, oops, sorry. We also are featuring our new student members this month. Um, you are a valuable part of our community. So welcome to these 15 new members. Uh, if this is your first CIC webinar. I hope you really enjoy it. Next slide. And we also have some upcoming dates to highlight before we get started. Our registration is now open for the annual conference. Um, it's going to be a virtual virtual conference similar to last year's if you had a chance to attend. As I mentioned before, the CIC is planning a really fantastic lineup of presentations. So you can click the link in the chat to learn more, save the date. Um, we also want to highlight our competitive and decisions intelligence certificate program. Uh, this program will would help you ed, uh, enhance your sorry, enhance your research analysis and intelligence skills, increase your value and support competitive intelligence planning and decision making in your organization. Courses include recorded lectures and live discussions with the flexibility that you can fit it into your schedule. Um, I'm gonna go off script here a minute. I did participate in this certificate program years ago and found it very helpful and I recommend it to my employees when they have a chance to take advantage of it. Um, you can click the link to their in the chat for full course descriptions and to learn more about the program. Um, and, and sometime in the next couple of months, our, our monthly schedule is a little disrupted because of the conference, but there will be another webinar. So say, stay tuned to the uh, SLA CIC social media channels and your email to find out about more about those as we update them. Uh, next slide, please. So we want to thank all of our attendees for giving us feedback on the uh, the webinars. This is from this is some feedback from the previous webinar. Um, one lucky attendee today will be randomly selected to win twenty five dollars. So so we do hope that you will tune in, participate in the discussion, and enter to win. So here's what a previous month's giveaway winner said. Um, this was the best. SLA webinar I've attended in 22 years. The speaker presented clear, detailed, yet high level overview. He provided just the right amount of detail. So best in 22 years, you can't really beat that, but we're gonna try. Next slide. And we will also be live tweeting, or if you are live tweeting during the webinar, uh, please use the hashtag CIC webinar to share any insights or thoughts with your network on Twitter to keep the conversation going. Next slide. And finally, what you guys have all been waiting for, um, and introduce our presenter for today, Michael Hill. Michael is a research editor and analyst at 451 Research. He brings his perspective as a MLIS research pro and writer editor with extensive experience in VC and tech M&A. So with that, we'll go ahead and kick off the presentation. Thank you, Kate. Uh, hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, yeah, here we go. What info pros need to know about researching venture capital. Hi there, my name is Michael Hill and I'm a librarian just like most of you. I've worked in a variety of roles since earning my MLIS from the University of Washington in 2005. 
uh, but the most, probably the most interesting and satisfying job uh, I've had since then was uh, working as a research analyst for Austin Ventures, a uh, venture capital firm in Austin, Texas. I currently live in Fort Collins, Colorado, and I work remotely for 451 Research, uh, which is a business-to-business -business independent research firm based in New York. We were acquired a couple of years ago by S&P Global. Off the clock, I'm an avid music fan and a fly fisherman. Um, here I am with Bruce Springsteen in Denver a few years ago, and here's a big rainbow trout I caught this spring outside of Aspen, Colorado. Today, we're going to talk about researching venture capital. First, I'll try to give you an idea of how the world of venture capital functions. Then, we'll talk about what VC research entails and where and how information professionals fit in. Let's get started. Here's some data I pulled from the National Venture Capital Association's most recent yearbook. This annual report provides statistics on the size and impact of the US venture capital industry. Some of this terminology may not compute with you, but hopefully by the end of this presentation, it will. The main thing I hope you take away from this slide is that there is a lot of money tied up in venture capital. Okay, so as I said, I used to work for a venture capital firm. If you're like me, back when I was hired on, you might be thinking, what exactly does a venture capital firm do? At the most basic level, VC firms raise money from investors to invest in companies they think will be successful and, most importantly, will make them money. By successful, I mean they hope they can grow these companies to the point where they exit, which is what you call it when a company in a venture capital firm's portfolio either gets bought or acquired by another company or goes public via an IPO, which stands for Initial Public Offering. That's when newly issued shares of a private corporation go on sale to the public through a listing on a stock exchange. The money that VC firms raise from investors, which are referred to as limited partners, is pooled to form funds that VC firms draw from when making investments in startups. After 10 years, usually, a fund closes, the limited partners get their money back, along with a percentage of the profits, usually 75 to 80%, and the venture capital firms get the remaining 20 to 25% of the profits. VC firms also make money off management fees, which they receive from limited partners for managing venture capital funds. There are any number of other ins and outs involved, many of which I honestly still don't totally understand, uh, but that's the basic idea. As I mentioned, when I worked in the venture capital industry, I worked for Austin Ventures. The firm had already been around for a couple decades or more when I joined and had experienced its share of both successes and failures. Many funds fail to produce returns. VC firms and their limited partners look for the ones that do to make up for those that don't. Some of the companies that AV helped get off the ground are or were Silicon Labs, Active Network, Retail Me Not, SailPoint, Bazaar Voice, and Home Away. Home away, you may know, if you've ever rented someone else's home, cabin, condo, villa, or castle to stay in on a trip. The company was an online vacation rental marketplace, and it was incubated in-house by Austin Ventures. By that, I mean eventual Home Away CEO Brian Sharples was given money by Austin Ventures to buy up a whole bunch of small online vacation rental businesses and put them together to form what eventually became Home Away. Six years later, the company exited via an IPO and did business as a publicly traded company for four years. Then Expedia, which was owned by Microsoft until it was spun off into a public company in 1999, came along and acquired uh, HomeAway, taking it private, meaning it no longer traded on the NASDAQ, and eventually merged HomeAway with another large vacation rental business that they owned, VRBO or Verbo, I guess as they're pronouncing it now, which strikes me as odd. Anyway, they ultimately uh, uh, absorbed HomeAway into uh, the VRBO brand, and uh, now it's all just VRBO. 
When you're a research analyst at a venture capital firm like I was, most of your responsibilities lie in early stage due diligence that helps firms decide if they want to invest in specific opportunities. Since venture capitalists are out to make money, first and foremost, the most important thing for them to know is how potentially lucrative an investment can be. To help them answer that question, they usually want to know what the market size or the re revenue opportunity is for a particular company. That is, going from large to small, how much money is there to be made in a particular market, how much of that uh, market can a certain type of company serve, and finally, out of that serviceable market, how much of it can the company in question actually reach? Beyond the market itself, venture capitalists like to know about other companies that operate in a particular market, many of which will be private, likely be private companies, to get a sense of what they call the competitive landscape. VC research also finds you doing background research on executives. They don't bring in a Brian Sharples, for example, uh, until they've done their due diligence on him. Uh, it also involves performing regular news runs uh, on companies uh, or markets of interest um, and using financial data services, we'll get into some of those in a second, to produce uh, trading comparables and acquisition comparables, otherwise referred to as comps. Simply put, trading comparables provide an idea of what public companies in a particular sector tend to trade for while acquisition comparables provide an idea of what private companies that get bought by other companies sell for. A venture capital research analyst's best friend can often be a report published by an investment bank on a public company or a whole market. Investment banks are the entities that broker acquisition agreements and help companies issue shares of stock in an initial public offering. Investment bank reports, also known as equity analyst reports, can be VC research gold for all the in-depth insight they can offer on a particular market and the companies that operate in that market. Unfortunately, they're not necessarily easy to get your hands on. They tend to be available either via an antiquated entitlement process from the individual bank or a subscription-based financial data provider like Capital IQ or Thompson One both of which aggregate reports published by multiple banks. Sometimes, though, you can find them buried on the deep web in the event that someone has posted one somewhere for some reason with the idea that no one who doesn't know it's there will never find it. They clearly are not librarians. In addition to investment bank reports, Capital IQ and Thompson One also offer extensive public company financials sourced from the quarterly earnings reports that public companies are required to file with the Securities and Exchange Commission. That is to say, just because you don't have a pricey subscription to Capital IQ or Thompson One doesn't mean you can't lay your hands on this data. They just make it all easier to digest, manipulate, and download. Other paid sources for venture capital researchers include independent research providers or analyst firms, including Gartner, Forrester, IDC, and shameless plug here, 451 Research. Uh, these companies employ analysts who, like those at investment banks, provide coverage on companies both public and private in particular slices of the, of, uh, the tech industry. They also tend to deliver data through various other means. Since venture capitalists like to stay on top of the news around their investments, uh, business or tech-oriented news publications like the Wall Street Journal, TechCrunch, or the Business Journals, that's the parent company of the Austin Business Journal, LA Biz, Cincinnati Business Courier, and 40-some other regional business-focused publications, can be extremely helpful, uh, as can news aggregators like Factiva. In my experience working for Austin Ventures, we also sometimes leveraged legal databases like PACER or Westlaw for information on court proceedings uh, and executive backgrounds. Finally, federal government databases can also help researchers help venture capitalists better understand certain markets. Census Bureau data, as well as data from the Small Business Administration can help when there's not a lot of other data available elsewhere. 
So then hopefully you're starting to see your potential place in this ecosystem. As in other workplaces that are home to informational prof information professionals like you, having an in-depth knowledge of resources is key. You need to know where to look for what, often in a hurry. And since sometimes even the best resources can fail you, you also need to be a clever online sleuth, uncovering deeply buried documents and data points, and oftentimes using unconventional search techniques uh, such as reverse engineering, which is basically working backwards towards answers to your questions to produce useful insights. Finally, it's crucial to be able to effectively analyze and synthesize your findings to efficiently resolve research inquiries, as opposed to just handing over reams and reams of data that still need to be sorted through. Though it's been a little while since I've done actual research for a venture capital firm, here are a few tips and tricks I can offer based on my experience in that world. If you're having a hard time finding information on a private company, see if you can find their business registration, likely via the Secretary of State website for the state where that company is headquartered, to determine either the company's former name or its doing business as name, which is often a public-facing moniker for a flagship product or a web property. For example, Alphabet, which primarily does business as Google. If you're trying to find information on an acquisition and the deal is not showing up in the standard financial databases, it's possible the acquisition was part of a roll-up, a practice whereby a private equity firm buys multiple companies in the same industry and rolls them up together into a single larger company, kind of like HomeAway. These transactions are sometimes hidden from view, especially when a recently acquired company makes an acquisition of its own a transaction that was most likely funded by its new parent company. In those cases, you might look at the LinkedIn profiles of employees of a known to be acquired company to see if they might be working simultaneously for both that company and the company whose acquisition details you're seeking. Or maybe see if you can identify separate news stories about both companies. They might even reveal the company's individual plans to relocate their headquarters to the same city. All of this information can at least help you draw some reasonable conclusions about the transaction in question. If you don't have access to pricey research products like Capital IQ and Thomson One, which aren't always perfect anyway, and you're trying to determine how much money a private company has raised from investors or who their current investors are, look for that information in Form Ds, which uh, companies are required to file with the SEC when they receive investments. You can find them either through the, through the SEC's Edgar website at sec.gov or through a free to access Form D aggregator like formds.com. Sometimes you can even get private company revenue information from Form Ds. Edgar or sec.gov can also be a great source of private company info via Form S1s, which private companies must file with the SEC before making an initial public offering or an IPO. S1s are lengthy, often hundreds of pages lengthy, reports that provide potential investors all kinds of information on a company, including those companies that the filer considers competitors and can help you construct a competitive landscape for a particular market. And that's it, at least for today. As you can probably tell, we've really only scratched the surface of all that venture capital and venture capital research entails. But hopefully the information I've been able to share with you here today gives you at least a basic idea of what all is involved. If you have specific questions, I'm happy to try to answer them, no guarantees, in the time we have left. You can also feel free to email me with questions after the fact, should you have any. While I've provide, provided my, both my business email and my personal email here, my Gmail address is probably a better one to use to help keep any queries from falling through the cracks. Beyond that, uh, thanks for watching and listening, and I hope you feel like you learned something today. All right, thank you so much. Um, I don't have any questions showing up yet, but uh, if anyone, oh, wait, here's one. All right, so I have a question today. It says, um, hi, thank you for sharing this info. I was wondering what your process for getting into this role from an MLS, MLIS degree was. 
uh, uh, dumb luck, um, mostly, um, and networking. Um, I met a I met a guy through um, another contact I had, who actually was my um, predecessor at Austin Ventures, a guy named John Jameson, really fabulous researcher and uh, also a musician, like uh, I've been known to be. And um, we hit it off, and he recognized that I had the skill set that uh, could uh, you know handle this kind of work and. So when he eventually left the firm, he asked if I would take his role, and um, I, I did gladly. But I, I should say, um, in terms not just knowing someone, um, I was uh, uh, also well, also kind of dumb luck to <laughs> situation. Uh, before I joined Austin Ventures, I'd done a couple of um, uh, internships at the Seattle Times News Library, and you probably wouldn't think that that sort of uh, uh, experience would necessarily prepare me for a venture capital firm, but it was actually remarkably similar. Just um, the kind of the, the pace of of the of the research and and uh, you know very deadline oriented and you know just knowledge of resources was key, like I said. And um, so it was just kind of adapting. I think the skills I'd already built up to the the, you know, the, the venture capital environment. Wonderful. And we have a few more that came in. Uh, Richard has asked us, asked us, do you have any tips for reach, researching uh, SPACs, SPACs? Yes. Um, actually, I, I deal with those a lot in my current role at 451 Research. Um, for me, the best source of information on these SPAC, uh, uh, these reverse, reverse acquisitions, these SPACs, has been the investor presentation. So generally, when I have to um, you know, uh, I, I I work for uh, 451 Research and on the tech M&A team, and our main deliverable is a, a database, a subscription database product called the M&A Knowledge Base. And so we have to, it's kind of a real-time M&A database, and uh, so we have to get all the all the deals in and and uh, all the details on them, and then report on them. So I go directly to the investor presentations, which um, if you can't find them just via the web, just you know via a, a Boolean search, uh, they're often in the 8K of the uh, that the acquirer has filed, um, and uh, you can just they're one of the exhibits usually. But yeah, go straight to the investor presentation, and and those will give you uh, you know bang for your buck wise the you know the, the best stuff. And for uh, some of us who are a little newer, what what is a spec? Is a special purpose acquisition company. So okay. basically, it's yeah, it's a vehicle for companies to go public um, that uh, it doesn't require the uh, you know the, the the traditional IPO process. That's very interesting. Uh, they they become very popular. Uh, uh, they, they became very popular in the in the COVID um, you know period and uh, have have sort of they they seem to be you know, have staying power, so. Yeah, so we actually had another question related to them. Um, how has the surge in SPACs changed where you, were, where, where you would search for information that has it all? I don't think it, uh, I don't think it necessarily would change where I would search for information, but um, uh, yeah, they certainly are uh, a force um, currently and, um, Definitely good to uh, you know get you know get yourself well versed in them and and kind of know how to look at them and where to find that information. Okay. Um, another question we have is: Can Michael please talk a bit more about the roll-ups approach? If we're talking. Sure. Um, so when I worked at Austin Ventures, um, you know we were technically a venture capital firm, although. Austin Ventures, the range of investments they did really spanned uh, the, the continuum from that classic early stage venture capital stuff to uh, later stage private equity. So basically, the, the main difference between venture capital and private equity is venture capital deal, deals with early stage companies, private equity deals with uh, more mature companies. Um, so uh you know we had a, a number of, of private and equity equity type investments when i was there um and you know they were in all sorts of industries um 
you know, some more interesting than others. <laughs> but um, usually the, the, the private equity uh, companies tend to be in less kind of sexy industries. So, you know, think gravel pits or um, uh, oil well rigging uh, equipment providers, uh, that, that sort of thing. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, from a research point of view um, and looking at how these companies would um, pursue these roll-up strategies, um, uh, my colleague Laura Young and I at Austin Ventures truly did uh, at one point um, map all the gravel pits in Texas um, to identify potential targets for a uh, a company in the Austin Ventures portfolio who was was looking to consolidate the the gravel pit industry. Um, we also uh, went. To, we uh, I, I mentioned um, uh, oil well uh, rigging equipment. Um, we had a company in the portfolio. I think Delta Rigging was the name. Anyway, they were uh, they wanted to. I think it was in the wake of that horrible oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico a few years back or several years back now. But they they. Uh, they wanted to wanted us to map all the abandoned oil wells in the Gulf of Mexico and figure out who owned them. And um, it was a long process, and uh, it involved digging through a lot of uh, federal government websites and databases, and getting on the phone and talking to a lot of people. But in the end, we eventually did. So, um, just a couple examples of of how companies. Uh, uh, who are looking to do roll-ups identify targets um, for those roll-up strategies. So hopefully that helps. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. So I know um, I work in aerospace defense and our, when our analysts come to us for research, they often don't make a distinction between venture capital and private equity. Yeah. They, they, they put it all under the same umbrella. So I didn't realize it's, there it's was a, a fuzzy. Yeah. I didn't realize there wasn't really much of a difference at all. So that's good to know. Um, yeah. So another question we have come in, uh, how would our search change if we were looking to find info on corporate VCs? Uh, in, info on, uh, oh, oh, uh, like, uh, like, like, okay, yeah, like, like, like corporate in, investment yeah, funds, yeah, I imagine. Like, like Hewlett Packard, you know, yeah, their, their business development, you know, their corporate, yeah, VCs. Um, um, I don't know that it would, the search would change so much. Um, you would probably, you know, rely on a lot of the same sources. Um, you know, I, I work for S and P Global, and we own Capital IQ. So, you know, my my mind goes straight to uh, Capital IQ for you know, uh, you know, getting information on say HPE's corporate you know VC arm. Um, but uh, you know that that information should be out there in the same types of of uh, places where you would find. Uh, information related to to other VCs and those kinds of investments. So um, I don't know if that's a great answer to your question, but uh, uh, I, it should be. I would imagine that stuff would live in the same in the same holes in the ground. In that same bucket. Let's see. Oh, we're getting lots of questions in here. Um, what are some examples of search strategies you would use to uncover equity research via the deep, deep web? I mean, I'm I'm kind of old school. I use a lot of Boolean, um, you know, file type searches. You know, a, a file type PDF has been my friend um, many times over the years, and you know, building long Boolean streams and uh, ending them with that. Um, or if I'm looking for, you know, data sets, you know, obviously you have file type XLS or XLSX, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, and just um, you know kind of uh, tweaking the string until you know you see the results kind of you know, hopefully change in your favor. I, I got some great advice when I first started at Austin Ventures from my predecessor, John Jameson. And uh, he told me once, um, researching uh, in that fashion can be kind of like a circle uh, or take on a, a circular um, uh, deal <laughs> sorry um like a circle because uh you start you know you 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 know you, you've got a boolean string and you're modifying it and you're searching for certain file types and you're finding certain things and then you know maybe you tighten it up into where you're you're seeing things that are more like what you're looking for but when you start to see the same things over and over again you realize you've kind of come to the end of the circle 
So you can kind of like, okay, well, I've kind of boiled that ocean. So um, uh, I don't know if that exactly relates to the, the question, but um, but yeah, that's how I go about it. Yeah, very good. Uh, question from Kimberly. Um, is there an acceptable rule of thumb failure rate for taking a startup to an IPO? Uh, yes. Well, is there an acceptable rule? Of, um, I mean, I think the failure rate is, uh, those are pretty well re reported, um, like in the NVCA research. I don't know that off the top of my head. Um, I know that it's a, a, a small percentage of, of, uh, of venture funded startups that actually make it all the way to an IPO. I can't remember the percentage. Although I think from what, um, from combing through the most recent data in preparing for this presentation. I think it's actually risen a little bit in the last few years, uh, but I don't know it off the top of my head, but I would recommend just going to the NBCA website, which I believe is just at nbca.org, and that is um, the National Venture Capital Association. And, and PitchBook, uh, another independent research provider, does a lot of their data for them now, so they would have that too. Yeah, good. Um, could you explain what reverse engineering is? <laughs> uh, that was another one that I got from uh, uh, JJ, that's John Jameson. Um, he was the first person I heard use that term. It's basically, yeah, like I said, it's it's hard to articulate. You're kind of working backwards towards an answer. So instead of just, you know, trying to, you're, you're, you're trying to think, um, uh, yeah, let's see, I, I might have an example here. Um, Give me one second. I've got some notes here that I'm obviously pulling from. Um, let me see if I've got something here. Uh, oh, sorry. One sec. No, that's not it. Um, trying to think. Um, can't cheat here. Uh, I think. I think. I. I think. I. I so uh, this report, if any of you read the piece that I wrote for the SLA magazine a thousand years ago about this subject, um, uh, I think I, I think I give an example in there and I don't have a copy of that on me right now. But um, yeah, it's, it's kind of, it's um, the, the roll up example I think I was trying to give is, is sort of an example of reverse engineering where you're you're you don't have a lot of information to start a standard sort of search with so you're taking little pieces and you're kind of reversing the timeline to work backwards you know you're kind of you're kind of rolling the snowball uh to work backwards towards uh getting an answer and i know that sounds just crazy but um uh i'll tell you what i'll i'll uh if you if you hit me uh, offline on my email, I can uh, I can give you some better examples than I can sitting here hemming and hawing about it. So thank you. All right, and, and I have a copy of that SLA article, so maybe we can okay. uh, send it out. Yeah, I I th I think I I think I, I I somewhat successfully articulated at least one example in there. So. Yeah. Um. Some more questions coming in. I got stuck up my other screen here. So Jessica asks, how do you go about searching LinkedIn? Uh, do you search directly using premium or do you use free access or a service? I have only ever just used the free access and found that it, it served my served my needs, you know, for what I was doing um, just as well. I, I I think the premium access tends to be more of an asset to like recruiters and that sort of thing, which, you know, uh, obviously that's, there's a big search component to that too. Um, I don't have experience with it, um, but uh, I did, I did, I did seem like I did just fine using the free access. Yeah, no, I, I use LinkedIn quite a, quite a lot and I use the free access as well. And you can actually turn it off, turn off the ability for people to tell you view their profiles. So, oh, okay. Yeah. I didn't even know that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> For Secretary of State filings, do you use a search platform that aggregates data across multiple Secretaries of States in the U.S.? Um, this would be especially for companies where you don't know where they are incorporated. Sure, I think you can do that um, through, you know, using a tool like I think Thompson One 
had uh, SOS um, search capabilities. Um, but uh, generally, I'll just you know pull together enough research on a company to figure out where they're headquartered and then go to the, the Secretary of State's website. All right, and um, do you use PitchBook? And if so, do you find it useful and or lacking? <laughs> they're a major competitor of 451. So um, uh, I have used them in the past. We did, uh, when I was at 451, or excuse me, when I was at Austin Ventures, we did subscribe to them for a while. Um, and uh, uh, they they were still, I, I, I think their product has matured since then, as you would expect. But uh, you know, people were excited about it at the firm when we got that subscription. Um, I think part of it is because they recognized that the interface is really important. A lot of the, a lot of the tools that um, that the VC researchers tend to use um, are not the most user friendly. I mean, even to this day, Capital IQ, which is kind of the one of the go-to products for folks in that industry, is still not the easiest thing to use. It's 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 kind of a mess. And PitchBook's interface is really clean and and makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, they, they have some great information for sure, and uh, you know, with all the uh, investments they've gotten from Morningstar and whatnot, you know, they've been able to grow their platform. So, um, no, they've got a great they've got a great product, and, and that's why we consider them a competitor for sure. It's always flattering to be considered a competitor. Uh, were there any tools or sources you found useful when you first started in the sector um, in terms of learning the language of venture capital? Hmm. Uh, probably there were. Um, you know, the the NVCA, which I've talked about a couple times now. Um, you know, those those yearbooks are great sources of information to um, you know to give you a, a, you know a, a, both a you know fifty thousand you know mile view and and uh, and then also a very specific um, up close view with the, all the stats and whatnot they include. So uh, that's a great place to start. Um, trying to think you know where else I might have dug in and uh, gotten information of course you know I uh, uh, my the colleagues that preceded me at Austin Ventures were helpful in that as well but uh, yeah and, and VCA would be a great place to uh, kind of really familiarize yourself and you know, take that dive All right. um, another question coming in from Charlotte when I have needed to search for the principles for VCs they can be very opaque Besides LinkedIn, is there a good source to find out who the investors and principals are? Sure. Um, some of the the financial data providers that I talked about, um, you know, the subscription services like Capital IQ. Um, I think PitchBook has that information. Um, uh, blanking on where else. Um, you know, those are places that I would go. Um, sometimes you can find those in SEC filings uh, because um, VCs usually tend to, to uh, put a, a partner or two on the board of, of companies they invest in. So if those companies go public, um, you can you can you know, sometimes find information on on uh, on partners um, who are board members of those companies. Um, those are the three. Those are the the three sources that kind of can come up with off the top of my head. But again, that's another one I could probably put a little more thought to. Okay, great. And, uh, could Michael please clarify what DBAs, FKAs refer to? Oh, sure. That's uh, uh, as far as company names. A, a doing business DBA is doing business as. That's the that's the Alphabet Google example. Alphabet does business as Google, um, and FKA is formerly known as. So. Um, I'm trying to think of a, a good formally known as uh, off the top of my head. Um, saw some the other day when I was preparing this. Um, anyway, yeah, what you know, you know, Joe's um, software company. You know, now it's known as Microsoft or something like that. You know. Another sources question: What sources are available to search for venture capital or private equity companies? Um, I'm aware of PitchBook and PreQuin. Are there others besides Capital IQ? especially if I'm looking for who are the representatives on deals, investment banks, financial advisors, law firms, that kind of thing. Sure. Uh, 451 research, uh, that's something <laughs> that we definitely specialize in. Um, 
uh, CB Insights uh, does that kind of work as well. Um, uh, you mentioned PitchBook, that's a good one. Capital IQ is a good one. Um, yeah, those are probably the probably the, the the main ones I can come up with. All right, I, th I think we might be running down on questions. Um, someone did post. Oh, I see. Liz has reposted it. So the the uh, SLA article you mentioned that you okay. wrote on uh, venture capital is available in chat. Great. Let's see. Questions through here. Oh, here we go. Another sources questions. Do you have any go-to sources on the Canadian company side? Hmm. I, I I wrote a piece for 451 not too long ago on uh, uh, Canadian tech acquisitions, but I think I used all in-house research for that. Um, I don't know. Um, uh, you know that that information would be collected again in a lot of the subscription tools. Um, uh, I, you know, I, I, I'd have to double check the coverage, but you know, I, I know Capital IQ, you know, uh, you know, there's a, it covered North America. So, you know, they, they would have, uh, as well as the, the whole world, obviously, but um, uh, you know, they would have that kind of information. I, I assume PitchBook, um, I, I think, I, I think they're, yeah, they, they cover international deals. So they would have that. Um, I think uh, beyond that, it's just you know that's that's where if you don't have access to this stuff, you um, you know you you really engage those uh, sleuthing kinds of skills that um, that you've developed as an info pro and to uh, you know to, to figure out you know you know like a Canadian business publication and, and uh, you know what um, you know. Uh, what what might be the best? I might have some of that information, so that that's another one. If you want to hit me offline, um, I could probably pull a few sources for you. Wonderful. Let's see. So some, someone mentioned uh, local newspaper articles. If you find them to be helpful, Factiva, newspapers.com, or Newsbank as aggregators. I know you mentioned biz journals. Yeah, yeah, we used uh, Laura Young and I used Factiva quite a bit. At Austin Ventures, um, uh, I love the the biz journals. Um, that uh, more often than not, you know, uh, a CEO will, will quote a revenue figure or something that you know is is tough to get that uh, that a, a partner at a venture capital firm will, will want to know. And the the biz journals um, definitely have a you know a finger on the pulse of of what's going on in the in the private company world um and uh know how to draw information out of out of folks i i, I think there's a i don't know i I, th I think just the you know the, the particular focus of the business journals maybe makes um the subjects of those pieces a little more comfortable you know sharing information that you wouldn't find in more mainstream publications so yeah i'm a big fan but yeah uh, the aggregators are great um because you know i think i talked about you know, doing news runs that was a that was a big thing that we did a lot of at austin ventures um you know just like you know give me you know give me you know 20 news stories over the you know past couple months on company x or or this particular market you know kind of sift through and give me the best ones and you know using those aggregator products makes that really easy or easier Another career question coming in. Um, how do you recommend learning about job openings in, B in the VC ecosystem? That's tough. You know, um, like I said, I, I knew somebody, and um, I, you know, I was I was fortunate for that. Uh, and strangely, um, you know, Austin Ventures, which you know, was a it was a pretty prominent firm uh, in its heyday, they used to um, advertise for some some of the you know the obviously the non uh, you know partner or a general partner you know uh, those kinds of positions the the support staff like like research was considered they would actually advertise on craigslist which i thought was kind of fascinating really? <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh but uh uh i know i know before i talked to john about austin ventures um i think he had um put out a job listing um via the sla job board so you know, I would definitely, um, you know, 
when the folks in these positions are librarians, they're gonna kind of you know know where to find other librarians. So um, the SLA job board would probably be a great place to start. Uh, and I think that still exists, right? Oh yeah, it's still around. Okay. And I know people often put uh, jobs in SLA Connect as well. Okay. That might not make it onto the formal uh, job board. Uh, I, I've actually seen some in, uh, there's a, uh, a message thread called uh, BizLib, and uh, I've been on that, and that's a good one to get on. on. Um, I can't remember who the organizer is for that, but um, that's another one. If you want to ask me offline, I can, I can get you the information on that. Um, somebody else mentioned like what kind of job titles you might they might keep an eye out for uh, information professionals I know you mentioned you were an analyst yeah I it, it seems like I've been tagged with with research analyst for much of my much of my post uh, library school career um, it's kind of a catch-all term um, uh, you know, I, I in my current role, I do do uh, you know some more editorial stuff just because I deal with newsletter content and stuff that goes into our database and all that. So a lot of QA and editing stuff that comes in from our analysts and that sort of thing, as well as writing. Uh, but uh, research analyst tends to be the kind of the standard um, uh, uh, title. I did see something recently. Actually, I think via that that BizLib thread, uh, it was a, a job similar to the the one we did at Austin Ventures, but it was for Eastman Kodak or Eastman or whoever uh, owns who now, um, and they were calling it information consultant. Um, so that's another um, that's another phrase you might keep in mind. Yeah, I've seen information consultant for research positions, and I've also seen it for like knowledge management type positions. Yeah, yeah, knowledge, yeah, knowledge manager, that kind of thing. Scrolling one last time to make sure I didn't miss any. Come on, just in time. And as Michael mentioned, he's happy to take follow up questions via email. That information is not on the presentation, which will uh, be available. There's a link to the presentation in the chat. So thank you very much, Michael. This has been a wonderful hour together, um, and we appreciate your insights. And Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. And once again, we'd like to thank our audience for all your uh, wonderful questions and participation. Um, one lucky attendee today will be selected to win $25, and you'll receive an email from us if it is you. Um, this webinar has been recorded, so please watch for an email following the webinar, which will have a link to the recording on SLA's CIC YouTube channel. Um, now, all of our webinars are there, so if you've missed one, you can go back and take a look. I know I'm very guilty of registering for a webinar and then finding myself on a conference call and having to go back and watch it later. <laughs> there will be another SLA CIC webinar in the future, so stay tuned for that. And I hope to see you all at the conference. So thank you. See you guys all uh, some future webinar in the future. Thank you.